Hello everyone, Rob Berthoff here, and we're continuing in the Revelation series. Uh, we're now in chapter 13. Uh, this is um, really leaving off in chapter 12. We started seeing this, this power struggle between light and dark, good and evil. And now in Revelation 13, we're starting to see who the darkness, uh, Lucifer and his fallen angels, are using to carry out uh, their work here on earth. So, starting right into it, Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, this is John talking, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like a bear, and his mouth like a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So there is a lot to unpack here. But the beast coming out of the sea means that a uh, ultimately a power is coming up out of a very populous area. The sea, if we if we remember the metaphor class that we did, the sea is um, a multitude of people. Waters typically refer to people and multitudes. So the beast coming up out of the sea. Now he had seven heads. So this is going to be seven different ruling bodies, and each of those, um, and he has ten horns. Okay. Um, the ultimately horns typically represent kingdoms, and then we have ten crowns. This means again that uh, the crowns um, are uh, the, like I said, the kingdoms, when the horns, um, the horns being the nations. Let's see here. Then we, uh, upon his head, blasphemy. So this is not a, um, a beast that is from God. And then we see a leopard, a bear, a dragon, and a lion. And what I think is very interesting with this is that those are the same. Uh, it's the same imagery that we saw in Daniel 7. So in Daniel chapter 7, we find that the lion was Babylon, the bear was Medo-Persia, the leopard was Greece, and the dragon was pagan Rome. So when we go back and we're analyzing this, this beast, right, ultimately we find that it's a combination, right? So it's ultimately a... Um, an amalgamation, it's a, it's a combination of all these different ones. The Lion of Babylon, known for pride and wealth and power. The feet of Medo-Persia, uh, for harsh laws. And the body of the, of the leopard, right, which is swift and, and powerful, which is Greece. And its authority came from the dragon, which was in Rome. What's interesting about the body is, like, why a leopard, right? It could have any of the body parts. It could have been the beast, you know, like, um, why a leopard? And a uh, little tangent, but Jeremiah 13, 23 rhetorically asks, you know, can a leopard change its spots? Meaning, once a beast, always a beast, right? You know, despite a recent shift trying to be more appealing to Protestant uh, churches, um, it, its history cannot be forgotten. And um, so we can look here that uh, Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of its heads, and it was wounded to death. And the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay? Let's point a few things here. There's a lot that sticks out. The first is, and I saw the wound, right? It, had, it was wounded to death. So Revelation 13, again, refers to this, um, this time period where the papacy was, um, you know, this deadly wound was inflicted. And this is, we know, is from in 1798 when Napoleon's war chief, uh, General Berthier, um, ultimately entered into the Vatican, took Pope Pius VI prisoner, and after a torturous journey, Pius died. The Pope died. And the death, it says, dealt a great blow to their political power. So this is the deadly wound. But if we keep reading that verse, it says that the deadly wound was healed, and all that worshipped after the dragon, so which gave the, a power to the beast. So yet the papacy is back in power, right? And the wound has been healed, um, but now the Pope reigneth over all the kings in the earth. That's a quote from, from another verse. And they, so we're speaking of now, um, they worship the, the, the devil, the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, the papacy, right? and they also worshiped the beast, the papacy, saying, who is like unto this beast, and who is able to make war with them? So it's, it's um, you know, we read here that, uh, the next verse, and there uh, was given unto him um, a mouth, uh, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him to continue 40 and 2 months. Now, this is 42 months, so 42 times 30 is 1260 days. We cover this in detail in the Bible Prophecy course uh, 1260. 
So I recommend taking a look at that. The uh, This time period, ultimately, though, uh, was a time period where the papacy had um, pretty much unchecked control. So before the, the period where um, the deadly wound was inflicted and then healed is, is that 42 months. And that's 538 to 1798. And he opened his mouth... Uh, in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all the kindreds and tongues and nations. So again, we see the same figure will blaspheme, but what specifically, right? We find, you know, this, this idea, he says, you know, I'm, you know, I can forgive sins. I'm God on earth, right? What are these these uh, these claims that the papacy makes? Specifically, um, indulgence, right, is the teaching of the Catholic Church. Um, we've already covered this, where um, preaching, uh, teaching the forgiveness of sins. But ultimately, um, you know, we find in First Timothy two five that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. In Hebrews four uh, fourteen and fifteen, that uh, Jesus is our high priest in heaven. Not we don't need a man on earth to be our high priest, um, and that God alone forgives sins. So the claim that any man can forgive sins, and then they add the fact on their charging to forgive sins, uh, is absolute blasphemy. The other piece is they claim uh, the Pope claims uh, supreme authority and uh, infallibility, which means that uh, it cannot uh, have any error on doctrine. It's impossible to have error. So when they then change, Daniel 7.25, I think to change times and laws. By the way, the only law that's also time is the Seventh-day Sabbath. So when the um, Roman you know, Catholic Church ultimately began the changing of the Sabbath uh, from Saturday to Sunday, right, this was also you know, predicted, right, and this was also the blasphemy that we're revealing here. Now, um, I can prove the whole Seventh-day Sabbath thing was not changed because of the day Jesus rose. It wasn't changed by the disciples. There's no biblical proof to this. And, and if you don't agree with me, I would love to um, you know, discuss this with you or watch my course. It's, I have every, um, known that I, every argument that I know of covered in this course. So let's get back to the beast. We continue here that um, you know it was given him this 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 time to continue. And that was a 1260. Again, I go in detail on that in this course here. I recommend that time period starts just as a quick refresher um, when in the transition from pagan Rome to papal Rome in 538, when Justinian handed over the power of Rome to the Church, declaring himself a theologian, and he even instituting a seventh day Sabbath persecution. Right, Novella uh, 140, um, 144, I think it was. So. Uh, let's finish up at verse 7. And it was given unto him uh, to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. So this is, you know, what happened. It was genocide of the Protestants for literally, you know, hundreds, if not, you know, uh, over thousands of years, over a thousand years, right? Um, where there was just full on, you know, if you believed in the Bible, you were thrown in jail or worse, right? Uh, there was, you know, un unlimited, I don't even know how many people, there was a lot of people killed. So we'll continue on. And all that dwell on the earth will worship them. Now we're talking about, we're now in the future here, okay? We're moving, we're moving, because this is a, um, uh, on the, you know, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. If any man have an ear, let him hear. So if someone worships a beast knowingly, their name is not in the book of life. And if we're worshiping the beast, ultimately, uh, we will not be having the seal of God. And we read a little piece here. He that leadeth in captivity shall go in captivity. He that kills the sword will be killed by the sword. Okay, so we're, we're kind of talking about this, this period of time where, um, you know, the, the God's people were held captive, God's people were killed. But what it revealed, which is beautiful, is that it revealed the patience and the faith of the saints. And so the patience and faith of the saints were revealed through this really dark time in Earth's history. So we're going to read here, and then I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Now, what's interesting is the first, the, the, the beast before that we read, ultimately was coming up out of the sea. A sea indicates a densely populated area. And here we see that a um, that the beast comes up out of the earth. So uh, an area that's not densely populated. Okay, and it has two horns and spoke like a lamb. Um, 
and um, oh, like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So how do you speak like a dragon? You inflict the same laws, the same persecution, right? So when we're looking at this um, two horns, right? It's interesting that we find that one horn uh, is republicanism, which is a, um, you know, ultimately a government without a king, right? And the second is Protestantism, which is a church without a pope, right? So it's interesting kind of describing that this, this next beast ultimately is uh, the United States of America. The same time frame happened, right? Uh, 1776, um, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole time period here up until you know, the Bill of Rights in 1791, right before the deadly wound was inflicted in the papacy. And what's interesting is, um, you know, when we look at the time period of the, of the construction of the Capitol building, it would overlap the same time as the deadly wound. And what's kind of bizarre is that, you know, if you go to the GSA website, it says that the U.S. Capitol um, had a Roman dome and temple front. So ultimately, it was created in the likeness of, um, of the papacy, right? Now, not in the spiritual likeness, but it was created in the literal likeness of the papacy. And we see even more similarities between the Vatican and the U.S. Capitol. We see the, uh, the pagan obelisk, right? Um, we see, uh, just like I said, there's just so many other, you know, the dome, et cetera, et cetera. So I dive much deeper in this in a course called Public Secrets. If you want to geek out on this and actually see just stuff that's sitting in plain sight that's just absolutely crazy, uh, take a look at that course. Now, let's move on. And verse 12, And he exercised power of the first beast before him and caused the earth which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, speaking of America or Protestant Christianity, exercised the power of the first beast, the papacy, and caused the earth to worship the papacy. So, Protestant Christianity um, has now begun to endorse Papal Catholicism, okay? And we actually see this. There is a huge ecumenical movement right now, the healing of the deadly wound, and we're told that the aligned, the allegiance will only get stronger. In verse uh, 13 and 14, he, that's Lucifer, does great wonders so that he can make even fire come down from heaven to deceive men using these miracles, which the devil does attributing them to the beast or the papacy convincing even the Protestants that they should worship the beast, which was the, you know, inflicted this deadly wound, but lived. So we're going to see here that Lucifer, who has the power to do, you know, great wonders, uh, ultimately will create these signs which are attributed to the papacy, and the Christians will continue to compromise in the state of apostate Protestantism. So, you know, who will it, you know, then essentially, um, they are then going to inflict, what we'll read in the next verse here, um, control on even Christians saying, hey, we all need to, you know, follow the same, uh, you know, the, the same you know, uh, worship and the same rules, etc. What we're going to see here is that uh, Lucifer, who had power to give life into the image of the beast, right? So now he's giving life under the Protestant, um, you know, apostate Protestantism, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So now we're seeing a death decree uh, now being put out here, right? So if you do not worship the image of the beast, and that's the, seven, that's the Sunday uh, Sabbath, right? It's their form of baptism. It's their form of, of, you know, of you know, a form of godliness that is not godly, right? Worshiping to man instead of, instead of honoring God. We find that there will be a time uh, where you know, those will be killed, now we've seen this, right? We've seen this through in Daniel. We've seen this throughout um, all throughout the the, the papacy, um, you know, 1260 years as well. This enforcement uh, is the National Sunday Law. We read here, uh, and he causes all, both uh, small and great, right, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, so real quick, stop there. The the mark is essentially your thoughts and actions. So. This idea of, you know, um, you know is the mark a, a, I don't know, a, what's the, people think it's like a, a, you know, a chip, an implant, right? No. Is it the vaccine? No. Okay. Uh, not that I recommend getting the vaccine. Doesn't get quite. Anyway, the point is this. Um, the idea here is that this is all about thoughts and actions, about decisions. Who do you worship, God or man? And that no man may buy or sell unless he's worshiping this false form of religion, right? The name of the beast and the number of his name. 
So this is considering the, the enforcement of the National Sunday Law. When we, we want to research more about the mark of the beast, we're going to do this in chapter 14, but ultimately understand that the mark simply is, um, if we are not choosing the seal of God and following his commands, we will by default get the mark of the beast. And it says here again that no man buy and buy or sell unless he received that mark. This means that there will be a Sunday worship enforcement coming. And you think, well, that's kind of crazy because, you know, especially in the United States, we have ch separation of church and state. But the papacy already did this in Europe in 538, like we mentioned. Right? In the United States, it's already gone to Congress to be passed in 1888. And it was it took um, A.T. Jones to go before the Senate Committee on Education and Labor in order to stop this bill, this Sunday law, from being passed. And we see again in 1911 that the Canadian uh, the, you know, there was a, um, a Roman Catholic Sunday League started to try and push uh, this next uh, Sunday law. Sorry, it was 19, um, in 1911 and 1923. So there's a history of this, and it will happen again. I you know, cover this in far more detail, um, but let's go to the final verse in chapter 13. We're going to look at Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. So six, six, six. Three score is twenty. So uh, score is twenty. So sixty. So God has given us really incredibly specific clues that we're not to be deceived, right? And so let's break this down. It says here is wisdom. Count the number of the beast. So how do you count a number? Right. The only way I know how to count a number would be, you know, Roman numerals. Interesting how, you know, even the numeral is associated, you know, the way of counting is associated with, with the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Empire, which it came out of. So the counting of a number, right? So we need to look for words um, that are going to be associated here. And we know that it's a number is a man. So let's look at the man and see what words can be counted, right? And there is a Latin inscription you know, on this beast um, that says uh, Vicarious Philly Day, okay? And we, we find this actually in the Catholic Journal, Our Sunday Visitors, Sunday, April 18th, 1950, on page three. And it says, question, what are the letters on the Pope's crown and what do they signify, if anything? And the answer they published, the letters on the Pope's crown are these, Vicarious Philly Day, which is Latin for, they say, Vicar of Christ. So, this, if we take the letters and give them the same value as the Roman numerals, right? V is Roman numeral for I, you know, for five. You know, one, I would be one, right? One. Uh, C is the Roman numeral for a hundred. We actually add up for Vic, um, Vicarus 112, Philly 53, Day 501. Add those together, you get, you guessed it, the number of a man. Okay, this is some crazy stuff, but... Why, right? The Bible tells us that we read in Second Thessalonians uh, two verses three to four, the man of sin, you know, is to be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth, exalteth himself above all that is called God and is worshipped, and uh, uh, so that he is uh, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Right? This is the man of sin. This is the papacy. Now, again, I want to point out, I'm not talking about. Catholics, I'm talking about Catholicism because there's a big difference. I'm talking about not the individuals because God says very clearly that he has sheep in many fold and there are um, amazing Catholics who are true and dedicated to God. Um, but what we're looking at here is a symbol, sorry, is a, is a system which the Bible itself says is corrupt. There's no other way I can interpret this, okay? And what's, what's interesting is that, that God loves us and doesn't want us to be misled. And in John 14, 29 says, I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you will believe. So God is giving us these signs to show when these things happen. The 1260 already happened, right? That the healing of the deadly wound already happened. And we will then be strengthened in our faith and we will believe ultimately what is coming. And there's coming a national Sunday law. And while it may not make, you know, you may not care right now, well, it doesn't really matter which day you worship, take my course on, on, on Sabbath truth, and I hope it changes your mind. But 
The point is simply this, is that there will be a time when this is the deciding factor. Do we keep God's law? That's all Ten Commandments. Or do we just kind of, uh, you know, just do what we want to do? To quick recap, um, you know, verses 1 through 8 describe the fourth trumpet, um, when the beast persecutes the saints. Verse 9 covers the fifth trumpet of the deadly wound to the papacy. And verse 11 through 18 describes the conflict between light and darkness in the period of the sixth woe. So this whole um, you know, time period, um, the 1260, ultimately fits inside of a, of a larger time period of the 2300 days, which if you haven't already taken that, to recommend the Time Prophecy course to understand how this all fits together. In the next of this series, we're going to get into Revelation uh, chapter 14, where um, after a quick little you know, closing of the, of the seventh, we're going to get into then the three angels message, which is going to be a very interesting topic. Highly recommend uh, coming back around next week for uh, the, next, uh, the next video. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. God bless.